Tim High Student Ministry Pastor here with Hope Fry, our newest TSM staff member, and we just want to welcome you. Thank you for joining us online as we gather this weekend. The church has gathered for thousands of years in many different ways, and one of the things that has remained consistent is putting our attention on God through worship. So, wherever you are, let's worship together.
Jesus, a holy one, I sing to you, forgiven Savior, I overcome with your Wherever you're watching and engaging with us right now, would you pray with me? Father, we are so grateful for who you are, that you are faithful to us, that you show up in times of need. We confess that we're not always strong and we are in need of you. And we ask that you would step in now in the areas of our need. Father, thank you that you are faithful, that you are with us. We pray for those in our church right now that are battling sickness, or in the hospital, or whatever it may be, would you be present there? We know that you are the healer and can touch our bodies, and we ask that you would touch these people now. Father, we think of those that are experiencing loss right now. It could be loss of a job or a friendship. Would you be present there as well? Would you be real in that moment and remind us that you are with us, even in our loss? Father, we're grateful for so many that serve in military, our men and women in uniform, in so many different ways. Father, we ask that you would guard and guide them with your wisdom today. We're grateful that we can gather. We're grateful that you are with us. Remind us that you are close. In your name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Well, so good to be together this weekend as we worship and gather and pray together online. Thanks for joining us. And thanks for being here. If you are new with us, we would love to connect you out of the Timberline community, get to know you, and also let you know a little bit what Timberline Church is all about. So right now there's a number popping up on the screen. If you would just text I'm new to that number, we would love to reach out, get to know you, and let you know what's going on here uh, at Timberline. Speaking of new, Hope Fry, our newest TSM ministry assistant working with our middle school, high school students, mm -hmm. Uh, and new, new city. You just moved here from Oregon. I did. I did. What are you thinking about Fort Collins? Honestly, I have loved it so much. I got to actually go to Horse Tooth a couple weeks ago with some friends. Nice. So nice. So beautiful. And so That's many good. things about it remind me of Oregon here. So another thing that reminds me of Oregon would be the fact that you guys do Royal Family Kids Camp. We just did a back to school event as well, but we don't want to just talk about it. We want to show you through this video. Check it out. Hi everybody, Pastor Jeff here. Wonderful to be with you again. And this weekend, we're beginning a series called What Just Happened. And I'm thinking that that phrase has been uttered by many of us many times over recent months as our world shifted into a completely different place. And it's kind of crazy. And we've looked around and we've said, what just happened? Well, in the Bible, there are lots of surprising, even shocking episodes, joyful times, delightful occasions, shocking, sad, tragic, unprecedented turns in the road. And over the coming weeks, we're going to be investigating a few of those. This weekend, we're zooming in on a really familiar story, the Passover meal that Jesus shared with his disciples, knowing that he was now very close to walking towards the cross. And effectively, Jesus is not just sharing a meal, but he's tying together three years, three years of teaching that he had shared. So we turn to John chapter 13, 
And there we read in verse 1, it was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the mill, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now, we know, let's just pause for a moment, that this would have been a what's just happened moment for the disciples. They would have been stunned by this action by Jesus. And we read further that Jesus went to wash Peter's feet. Peter protested. His protest was overruled. And Jesus washes those dirty, sweaty feet. That's the deal. If we want to be around Jesus, we have to allow him to clean us up. And then after that happened, we read in verse 12, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. When I attended Bible school in preparation for ministry, we used to have training in preaching and teaching. And they taught us back then, and it's still true today, that the way you begin a sermon or a message is really important. It's important to build a bridge and make a connection. And so preachers generally work hard at that. They'll share a story or an anecdote, an anecdote or maybe even a joke. Jesus used a variety of different teaching devices. He told provocative little stories, parables, nudging people to search for truth. On one occasion, he invited a child to come and stand among them, and he taught that childlikeness, not childishness, was a vital attitude and attribute if we are to enter the kingdom. In this, uh, in this foot washing episode, Jesus begins his teaching without any words. And it's very methodical the way that John describes what Jesus did. It's as, it's as if John wants us to really know precisely the actions that Jesus took. He got up from a meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, poured the water, began to wash their feet, took a towel, dried their feet. It's like John is building up the tension. And you can just imagine the disciples are, are looking around at each other, trying to catch each other's eyes, going, what's going on? What just happened? This is awkward. And of course, Peter broke the silence. Uh, he often breaks the silence and he gets his feet washed. And then Jesus teaches his disciples about servanthood, having first of all began his teaching without any words. And um, he's speaking, Jesus is speaking here to a particular situation in his team. Luke, in his gospel, uh, includes this detail in Luke chapter 22, verse 24. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. And this was not the first time that the, the, the conflict had broken out. You read in Matthew chapter 20, uh, conflict broke out because the mother of Zebedee's sons, James and John, her name was Salome, came and asked Jesus for the best thrones for her boys when he came into his kingdom. And this once again ignited conflict. Let's get away from the idea that being on the Jesus team meant that everybody was happy with each other all of the time. No, there was tension. There were arguments. And Jesus is saying by his action and by his teaching, wash each other's feet. Now, 
Now, the church has been confused about exactly what he meant. Was he teaching us that we should literally have foot washing ceremonies? I can remember a rather horrifying experience where I was at a relatively small prayer gathering in a home and I was quietly sitting there, my eyes closed, minding my own business, when I suddenly sensed that someone was tugging away at my socks. And I looked down and there's a, a lady there, I didn't even know her name, and she has decided that the Lord had told her to wash my feet. And um, frankly, it was all rather embarrassing. What was Jesus saying and teaching here? Was he suggesting that we should literally um, wash each other's feet physically? Some parts of the church have interpreted it, interpreted it that way. And so on Monday, Thursday, foot washing is a part of some rituals in some parts of the church. And in early England, Catholic monarchs used to wash the feet of 12 poor men on Monday, Thursday. Benedictine monasteries practiced foot washing as part of their hospitality to guests. And in the Greek Orthodox tradition in Jerusalem, the archbishop there recreates the foot washing scene by uh, sharing that with 12 priests, not only washing their feet, but kissing their feet as well, which frankly... I think is a bridge too far. But there were other interpreters like Augustine who saw this as a symbolic action, uh, a symbol of lowly service and nothing more. Surely what we can learn from this is that Jesus is teaching us humility and servanthood. And he's saying uh, if, if we've had our feet washed by him, by the cleansing of our sin, Surely we should have an attitude of serving and humility with each other. Jesus, as we'll see a little more later, is bringing uh, an example, his own example to us. There's a really interesting word in John 13 and verse 15. It is hupodiagma, um, and it's related to the word paradigma, from which we get our word paradigm. It means pattern. Jesus is giving us, as his followers, a pattern to copy. Um, the, in the ancient world, this word could be used for tracing a picture um, or an architect's plan. Jesus is saying, here's the pattern. Here's the plan. Live with an attitude of servanthood. And in, in, those ancient, in that ancient culture, in Roman culture, for example, humility was not prized at all. Surely again, the disciples are sitting there going, what, what just happened? Jesus is teaching a new pattern of living, servanthood. So what does that look like? Well, first of all, let's realize that servanthood is a radical call. We read, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them, in an uncertain world where love can be scarce, this call to serving can feel quite bewildering, not least because, let's face it, it's not terribly exciting washing someone's feet. And in those days where they wore sandals and the roads were filthy with all kinds of unmentionable things, this was not a, a pleasant task at all. Richard Foster says this, in some ways we would prepare, prefer to hear Jesus call to deny father and mother houses and land for the sake of the gospel than his word to wash feet. Radical self-denial gives the feel of adventure. If we forsake all, we even have the chance at glorious martyrdom. But in service, we must experience the many little deaths of going beyond ourselves. Service banishes us to the mundane, the ordinary, the trivial. Many little deaths. What an interesting phrase surely showing us the challenge that it can be to serve. And Pastor Darry, uh, I've uh, heard him say, you can know if you're a servant by the way you respond when people treat you like one. Let's realize that serving, it's a radical, it's a radical call. Secondly, let's know though that serving, it's a command, it's not just a piece of advice. Jesus said, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. 
This word Lord, Kyrios, was doubtless first applied to Jesus in respect of his teaching role, but but uh, here it's really loaded, and in John's Gospel, the word Lord means more than simply rabbi. In John 20, the words, my Lord and my God, would be spoken. And notice something here. Jesus says, you call me teacher and Lord. And then he says, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet. He reverses the phrasing of the words. He's saying, I'm not teacher and Lord, I'm Lord and teacher. He doesn't just give us advice. Jesus doesn't come to give us a helpful insight. Moses, as Ted Koppel, the veteran broadcaster, has said, Moses didn't come down from the mountain with the 10 suggestions. No, it was the 10 commandments. And in John 13 and verse 34, Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another. Now, in giving us the command, he also gives us help as well. This is not just about us desperately trying to serve merely in our own strength, because Galatians 5, 22, 23 tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, all those other beautiful characteristics. Yes, it's, it's the Holy Spirit at work in us that produces the servant heart. Nevertheless, often we come to junctions of obedience and we have to decide, am I going to obey the call to serve? Now let's just stop and think about that for a moment. Is there a situation in our lives where we've decided to make love and serving and humility optional? And quite frankly, we've opted out and we're thinking that it's just okay that we do that. Jesus comes to give us his command to love and serve. And it's not about whether we feel like it or not, and it's not about whether our natural disposition is to serve. It really is about obedience to his call. Thirdly, servanthood is about being like Jesus. He says in verse 14 and 15, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you, should also, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Jesus, not just our Savior, but our example. And we read about that too in Philippians chapter 2. It's been said that if John 13 was a portrait, then Philippians chapter 2 could be the caption to that portrait. Because it's there in that second chapter that the Apostle Paul is celebrating the amazing uh, humility of Christ in coming to our rescue. But this is not just a portrait celebrating the incarnation. It's also an exhortation that we should follow in the example of Jesus. And so in Philippians 2, Paul says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of, as Christ. It's then that Paul goes on to outline and celebrate the truths of the incarnation. But the context here is that Paul is saying, follow the example of Jesus. We are called to be like Jesus. I've often mentioned at Timberline that I quite like um, observing bumper stickers on cars. Some of them are quite funny. They're occasionally a little rude. And uh, I frequently find myself totally disagreeing with bumper stickers, especially uh, Christian bumper stickers. And I saw this one recently. Christians aren't perfect, it said, just forgiven. Now, there's a sense in which that's true. We're not perfect. We're broken people and we are forgiven. But the trouble with the statement is that it just stops there. And that's unhelpful. It was Dallas Willard who said most Christians have generally accepted that being a Christian had nothing essentially to do with actually following or being like Jesus. It was readily admitted that most Christians did not really follow him and were really not like him. Christians aren't perfect. 
just forgiven became that popular bumper sticker. While correct in the letter, this statement nullifies serious effort towards spiritual growth. The only absolute requirement for being a Christian was that one believes the proper things about Jesus. The doctrinal struggles of many centuries had transformed saving faith into mere mental assent to correct doctrine. We're called to be like Jesus. It was Bishop Stephen Neal who said to be a Christian is to be like Jesus Christ. Perhaps it, something like this has happened in some of our lives. We've just said, well, you know, that sounds great, but the truth is I, I'm never going to change. I, I can't be other than I am. The news is that in Christ, not only is change possible, but if we're walking with Jesus, change is inevitable. And the man who wrote these words, the Apostle John, he experienced that. He was one of those so-called sons of thunder. There was one occasion, you can read about it in Luke chapter 9, when he wanted to call down fire from heaven and nuke an entire village. But that firebrand became a great lover of people. He was the one who wrote in 1 John chapter 3, verse 18, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and truth. It's said of the Apostle John that in his final years, his primary message was simply this, little children love one another. The firebrand had become the lover of people. We can change. We are called to be like Jesus. Fourthly, servanthood is about remembering who we are and who Jesus is. In verse 16, Jesus says, Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now, Jesus is being very emphatic here in his teaching. He says, I tell you the truth. The King James Version is, Verily, verily, I say unto you. Truly, truly, in the Greek, it's Amen, Amen. Jesus is saying, Listen up. He often uses that as a teaching device. And what he's saying is, if I, the greater one, am called to be a servant, how much more should you, those who are lesser, those who follow me, you're called to servanthood as well. I think before we move on, it's important to also realize that the disciples were called to wash each other's feet after they'd had their feet washed by Jesus. Being able to serve, walking in humility, comes from a place of security in Christ. We can serve when we don't feel like we've constantly got to prove something, when we are secure in God's love, when we have a sense of settledness about who we are and who we're called to be, what we can do and what we can't do. Let's also realize as well that this call to servanthood can be abused and twisted into something quite ugly. I've heard of Christian spouses telling their partner that they had to accept abusive behavior because the Bible tells them to love and to serve. In fact, a few months ago, I heard a very famous Christian leader say that the Christian wife has to put up with abuse from her husband. And he actually said, until the first slap, and then she should probably tell the church about it. I really hope he was being misquoted. That is an outrageous perversion of the truth of servanthood and love and gracious kindness. We are called to remember who we are and who Jesus is, but that doesn't mean that we're called to be a doormat for somebody else's abuse. And I, I need to stop and say, if you are in um, a situation like that, it is time to call for help. You do not have to put up with that for the sake of the gospel. You don't have to put up with that because Bible verses are being used to pummel you into a place of subserviency and civility. That's not what God calls us to. The fifth truth is that servanthood is about action as well as attitude. Jesus says, now, now that you know these things, verse 17, you'll be blessed if you do them. You'll be blessed. 
It's the same word that is used nine times in the Sermon on the Mount. It's the word makarios. And it's an interesting little word because makarios was the Greek word for the island of Cyprus. In those days, it was believed that Cyprus was the almost perfect place, the place that had it all. And people would say, you've got it all if you're in Makarios, if you're in Cyprus. I don't know who generated that idea, probably the Cypriot Tourist Board, but Jesus takes that, borrows that metaphor, and he uses the word Makarios. He's saying, you've got it all in the Sermon on the Mount. You've got it all if you live like this. And he lists out those beautiful Beatitudes. And then here in this passage, Jesus is saying, uh, you'll be blessed, you're Makarios, you've got it all if you serve. And as we do that in our relationships, as we do that in our listening, because when we listen to somebody, we are saying something to them silently. We are valuing them. We are offering them something priceless. When we serve in our serving, and I know so many in our Timberline family, so many wonderful volunteers who tirelessly have given themselves to making a difference in northern Colorado and the wider world by the efforts that you have put in. And sometimes you can feel like an unsung hero and sometimes you really don't want to do it. But you see, what's wonderful about what you've done is that you've refused to just believe in the idea of servanthood, but you've done it. You've lived it. And Jesus celebrates that, commands that, it's not just about believing in the idea of serving, but actually living it. Well, the last thing is this, and that is that servanthood is, servanthood is about changing the world with a towel and with a bowl. Jesus said, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus is saying, as we live this, then heads and hearts will turn. People will want to know the reason for the hope that we have and the reason for the serving that we give. Andy Stanley, talking about the life of the early church, he describes them rather beautifully like this. He says, they gave, they gave their service, their money, their goods, their time, their safety, their creature comforts, their reputations. They gave to their own, but not just to their own. He said they scattered good everywhere, freely, indiscriminately. They had no expectation of payback. They loved the unlovely. They crossed over the street like the Good Samaritans. They rewrote the textbook on how to be a good neighbor. And then he says this, they looked for sweaty feet to wash. And then went even further, when terrible plagues hit and huge swashes of the population fled the cities, abandoning the sick, the Christians stayed behind, nursing the ill back to life, which meant that some of the carers died in the process. This was no holy huddle. When pagan priests fled, the Christians cared for the sick pagans, many of whom converted to Christ unsurprisingly. This doesn't mean that we will never need to share the gospel using words. The gospel is a message that does need to be verbalized. But what Jesus is showing us here is that as we love, as we serve, by this, others will know that we are authentically his followers. So where are you? Where am I being called to a place of an attitude of serving in our lives? And maybe we've resisted that. We've bristled against the thought of it. What a tremendous opportunity we have. These disciples, when they sat at that meal with Jesus and he took the bowl and the towel, and they're all thinking, what just happened? Could it be that this week, because of something that you do, an act of kindness, a simple moment of encouragement, a word of grace or perhaps forgiveness, that someone in the orbit of your life will say, what just happened? And perhaps in asking that question in their moment of surprise, they might realize some powerful truth about the Jesus that we serve. 
Martin Luther King Jr. said this, everyone can be great because anybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and your verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love. Serving. It can change the world. Let's pray together now. Father, we thank you that we see in Jesus the example of what it means to truly serve. He went all of the way to the cross for us. And we come before you and we confess that we can find it so very difficult to adopt not only a posture, an attitude of serving, but to bring that into action. We bristle, we resist, and we ask you to help us by your Holy Spirit. We ask you too to enlighten us to situations where we have just lost the capacity to serve. And maybe weariness has overtaken us. Maybe we feel that we've been taken for granted. Help us to serve. We also pray, Lord, for any who might find themselves in situations of oppression or even abuse, because the idea, the truth about serving and humility and being gracious has somehow become twisted and warped. Enable them to be courageous, to step out from that situation, we pray. Let me end this time by saying that, that perhaps this is an opportunity for you to become a follower of Christ. And the call to follow him doesn't involve excitement every day. It includes practical serving, sometimes which is very difficult. But it might be that today is the day when you realize that you need Jesus. And as a result of this moment, you might be finding yourself in a place where you're saying, what just happened? because you've given your life to Christ. If that's where you find yourself, I'd like to invite you to join me in this prayer. It's the first step in becoming a follower of Jesus. So why not share this with me? Lord Jesus, I invite you to come into my heart and life. I ask you to wash me clean, forgive me, I intentionally, intentionally, deliberately turn to you now. And I ask you not just to become my advisor or even my teacher and Lord, but you, my Lord and my teacher. Take charge. I want to follow you all the days of my life. And I make that decision, that momentous choice right now in Jesus' name. Thank you for hearing my prayer. And if you've just prayed that, then please uh, look out at the end of this service for uh, more information. We would love to help you in following through with that decision. What just happened? The beginning of our series. Look forward to seeing you soon. God bless. Thank you, Pastor Jeff, for those incredible words, inspiring, and they move us to action. This weekend, if you said yes to following Jesus, maybe for the first time, or you said yes to, I wanna take that next step, that connection point with him and engage in a new way, I wanna encourage you to check out a resource we have here at Timberline. It's called Starting Point. At timberlinechurch.org slash yes, you'll find a few things. One is that resource to take those steps. The next is a coach, someone that can come in and step and walk with you in your faith and in those next steps. As we close our time today, I want to say thank you for so many that have generously given to and through Timberline Church. Because of you, so many people have been impacted during this season and served in unbelievable ways. So thank you for giving through Timberline. If you'd like to give, you can give through the screen. Right now there's a number. You can give that way or you can give online at TimberlineChurch.org. Thanks for being with us this weekend. We can't wait to see you soon. And remember, this week, let's let love live. See you guys.
Stand a chance.